Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today for the first episode in our series on grasslands, where we'll be talking about culture, conservation, and resiliency. I am John Sanderson. I direct the Center for Collaborative Conservation at Colorado State University. And to present this series, we have partnered with some remarkable individuals at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, the Institute for Science and Policy, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and the Salazar Center for North American Conservation, also at Colorado State University, where I'm located. Um, you will be seeing uh, in the next three weeks, where in, uh, in the coming episodes for this series, you'll see individuals from these other uh, institutions and organizations moderating um, the, the future episodes. So I encourage you to join us for those as well. Um, uh, before diving into the content, I want to remind us that people have lived in North American grasslands for thousands of years and that indigenous people are still very much present on our grasslands today. Where I'm sitting here in Fort Collins on the Colorado State University campus, this area was the homeland of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. This uh, series was inspired by a large ongoing effort to conserve grasslands that's called the Central Grasslands Roadmap. Um, in some follow-up to this series, uh, when you get an email from us uh, uh, after, uh, after the series is done, we'll, we'll include, include a link to that roadmap in case you're curious about learning more. Um, this roadmap is an effort that, that includes indigenous people very much in the leadership of that effort and many, many others from agencies, nonprofits, state and federal agencies, universities, and so forth, all trying to work together towards resilient and sustainable grasslands and the many communities that they support from Canada down into Mexico. A reminder, as Nicole just mentioned, that you are invited to put your questions in the chat. Let us know what you're curious about. Um, uh, let us know what's not clear that you're hearing, what you would love to see, and we will be watching and monitoring that chat, and we will try to weave your questions and thoughts into the dialogue as we go along. We will be wrapping up right about one o'clock, and we won't get to all of your questions but we'll try to address as much as we can. So we have two extraordinary guests today. Um, the first person I will introduce is a dear friend from way back and also a long-term colleague at the Nature Conservancy. This is Terry Schultz, who is Senior Conservation Ecologist for the Nature Conservancy in Colorado, and uh, where she is a core member of the conservation science and planning team at the Nature Conservancy. Terry has worked for TNC for more than 25 years, and her current work focuses on developing and implementing a monitoring and evaluation and learning framework so we can continue to improve our work as we go along. Terry works a lot with ranchers and with staff and other nonprofits uh, wor uh, working towards improved management and better conservation outcomes. Uh, Terry also leads large-scale conservation planning efforts and has trained TNC and partner staff across the globe, including in the Rocky Mountains and throughout North America, and also in Thailand, Kenya, Mongolia, China, and India. Terry's on the executive board and an active member of two global conservation networks, one called the Conservation Coaches Network that helps people understand how to do conservation better, and a second is the Conservation Measures Partnership. So welcome, Terry. Thank you, John. I'm happy to be here. Super. Our, the second guest I will introduce is Dr. Amy Ganguly, who is National Program Leader at the US Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. After growing up in New England, Amy's research path took her west, where she conducted research for over 20 years in grasslands throughout the Great Plains from Texas to North Dakota, rangelands in the Rocky Mountain foothills and deserts, including the Great Basin Cold Desert, and most recently, the Chihuahuan Hot Desert of the Southwest. Amy's research interests are mechanistic, and Amy, I think I'm gonna ask you what the heck that means. Um, <laughs> and she focuses on invasive species, fire ecology, and uh, restoration ecology. And her work is closely linked to sustainable use, 
ecosystem services. We'll talk about that as well. And working with producers as, as Terry does as well. Producers, you know, people who farm and grow livestock uh, in our grasslands and working towards developing resilience-based management strategies. In her current position, Amy develops and manages grant programs to fund research, extension, and education activities pertaining to agroecosystems, sustainable agriculture, climate change, and disaster response to extreme weather. So uh, welcome, Amy. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Excellent. To kick us off, we're going to get a short, very short presentations both uh, from both Terry and Amy. And Terry's going to uh, share with us a few slides on the geography, habitat diversity, and just the beauty and the species and ecosystems that are in our grasslands. So Terry, if you want to pull up your slides and maybe tell us even just what grasslands are. Great. Thank you again for having me. And I'm really excited to be here and to share what grasslands are all about. So we thought we'd start with just providing some of that context. What are grasslands? Uh, obviously, grasslands are dominated by grasses, but they often have a lot of other flowering plants as well. Um, what they really don't have is a lot of woody plants. Sometimes they're shrublands and, and uh, you can, they're called by many different names. Sometimes we might call them prairies. Uh, in North America, we often call our grasslands prairies, but other parts of the world have different names for them. Either steppes, sometimes you might consider savannas, which have some trees, but not a lot of trees as a grassland. Um, other uh, uh, people might not consider those grasslands. So um, lots of different names, but really means one thing, dominated by herbaceous plants, so grasses and other flowering plants. And the one thing I want you to think about is that um, this is, I find this helpful to think about that grasslands are places where it's too dry to have forests and they're too wet to be deserts. So they kind of fall in that middle. And I also live in Fort Collins, similar to John, and I kind of sit at that, um, right at the edge of where there are grasslands to my east and there are forests to the west. And it's because of that precipitation gradient that there's not enough water down here on the prairie. Um, and because of the mountains, there's more water up to the west of me and therefore there's more trees um, and it becomes a forest. So dominated by trees, not dominated by herbaceous plants. So that's just to give you a little bit of context for what we'll be talking about the next four weeks. Also um, wanted you all to think about where are grasslands? And wanted to start thinking, well, mostly this, this series will be focused on um, North America, but it's, I think it's helpful to think about across the world. And grasslands are on every continent except Antarctica. So they are a common uh, part of the landscape around much of the world. And many people, uh, this is part of their livelihood, raising livestock on grasslands. Uh, and this, I, I particularly like this slide um, because it also shows you where we've lost grasslands. You can see that there are some places where they're fairly intact in Australia, Mongolia, uh, other parts of Asia, and in North America, and actually in South Africa. Those places where we still have some intact grasslands. But there are many places where we've lost a lot of those grasslands, where they've been converted um, often to row crop agriculture, but also to other uses, industrial and residential uses. And you can see that particularly in Africa um, and across uh, Asia and into Europe um, and, and in the US. And it's different aspects of grasslands for in uh, North America, the places where we have lost grasslands are furthest east, so our wettest grasslands in the tall grass prairie. Uh, those, uh, there's less than 10% of what um, was there uh, 200, 300 years ago. So there's a wide variety of grasslands around the world, and I'm not gonna get into too much detail about what they look like, but just wanted you to think about all the grasslands out there and all the people that are dependent upon it, upon them. And then um, I started to show you pretty pictures and I thought I can only show you a couple of species if I show you a couple pretty pictures. And I wanted to more give you the flavor for the 
um, the diversity of life that uh, calls grassland its home. There are many, many insects, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, uh, plants that call grasslands home. That this is the primary place they live. Some that are endemic, meaning they are only found in grasslands. And you can see some funny looking species up here. The one on the upper right is a prairie mole cricket, which creates a little acoustic den and calls in mates. I find them fascinating. I find all the species in grasslands fascinating and how they can live in the grasslands and find each other, these little bitty crickets um, across uh, Oklahoma and Kansas, that they can call in a mate that only, only that species can hear and, and find each other. All these species have uh, unique characteristics about their habitat and they all need something special about that grasslands provide to them. So just as you're seeing the different species, also think about that there are uh, herbivores out there. So things that eat grass. A lot of the species in grasslands are herbivores, but there are also some carnivores, swift fox and many other species that rely on, and the raptors that rely on these other species as food. Um, and I also wanted you all to think about, this, my last slide is really just looking at um, ecological processes. What makes grasslands special and what keeps them and maintains them? And two ecological processes are, are really important for grasslands. Fire, and these systems evolved with fire and grazing. And historically, that was bison grazing. And more recently, that mostly is livestock grazing. Uh, but we do not want to discount all the other things that graze out there, all the, the insects and the small mammals and such that also provide grazing processes out on the on the Great Plains. And this slide I also find helpful um, in thinking about what do grasslands need to look like. And mostly when we go out there and we just look across a grassland, it it seems pretty homogenous. It seems pretty similar across the board. But often it's not. When you really look down and you really look at what is out there, and in this slide you can see from the far left, you can see bare ground to uh, really taller grasses to shrubs. And different uh, species, this particular slide just shows birds, but different bird species and mammals uh, require different aspects of the habitat from bare ground. And there are some birds like mountain plover that will nest on bare ground. That's what they want. Their, their um, eggs look like the ground and that's how they hide them all the way up to uh, things such as cast and sparrow and others that really require shrubs. So what I really want you to take away from this slide is that it requires a variety of habitats out there. That if we just have one part of the habitat, we won't have all the species that we could have in the landscape. So having that diversity of habitat, diversity of structure, taller and shorter and, and thick and dense and, and sparse, all of that is important for different species of wildlife. I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to turn it over to Amy who will tell us about ecosystem services. Thank you, Terry. Um, that was great. And we're going to certainly circle back to, I've got quite a few questions for you about biodiversity on grasslands. Um, um, but before we get there, um, Amy's going to share a little bit with us about um, what grasslands do for us. Excellent, thank you so much. And, and Terry, uh, your presentation was a perfect segue uh, to talk about ecosystem services. And when we, when we think of ecosystem services, we're talking about the products, resources, and environment uh, that an ecosystem provides to meet um, our human health and well-being. And when we think of ecosystem services, uh, we put them into four categories, with the first category being critical uh, for uh, and required actually for the generation of all of the other ecosystem services. And so the first one being supporting services, really um, if we take uh, the presentation that Terry did, all of those uh, wonderful uh, biodiversity connections that she made, um, that really um, makes up a huge part of the supporting services um, in addition to things like nutrient cycling and primary productivity. Now, 
The other uh, ecosystem services, when we when we think of provisioning, we're, we're talking about uh, goods that are produced or provided. Regulating, these are the benefits that uh, ecosystems give us in terms of regulating processes like erosion. And then um, cultural services include uh, non-material uh, service, uh, non-material uh, benefits um, such as uh, recreation and others. But again, it's important to recognize the connection um, with uh, what we view as human health and, and well being. So now let's look at uh, grasslands. And one of the things I, I also uh, really appreciate uh, Terry um, highlighting the global context of grasslands. And, and one thing that's interesting when we look at uh, grassland ecosystem service science, China and the United States have really been the leaders in terms of, of advancing. Um, our knowledge of and um, also uh, some of our uh, programs to uh, specifically address ecosystem services. And so when we look at the areas that have been um, really uh, heavily uh, focused on in the provisioning category, you, you would um, expect these, especially from grasslands, uh, forage production, livestock, water supply, and habitat uh, being uh, the four dominant and in the regulating uh, category, carbon sequestration by far um, has the most focus. And certainly with our um, current need uh, to address uh, carbon sequestration related issues, um, it's really encouraging to um, recognize the amount of effort that's gone in to improve our understanding of that. Um, a close second is erosion control. Uh, a lot of work uh, that has been done in that area, water flow and climate regulation. And then in the cultural realm, um, it's interesting to note that the, the influence or the, the primary um, uh, focus has been on recreation and aesthetic um, and not as much spiritual. Although the awareness is there for spiritual, it just hasn't received uh, the same level of attention. So now let's connect this a little bit better with some of the information that Terry shared. And uh, we heard about biodiversity and we think of things like biodiversity and species composition we know that as those change, they have an impact on how ecosystems are structured and how ecosystems function. And so when we see those shifts, um, we, we recognize that um, the ecosystem services that are then provided are uh, also going to change. And so if, if we wanna think of this uh, pictorially in these three photos, we have a, a native diverse grassland, uh, we have a monoculture grassland, and then we have a, a corn field. All of these have uh, very unique ecosystem structures and functions, some more simple than others, um, but they um, all do provide ecosystem services, just very different ecosystem services. And finally, I wanted to touch on the concept of land potential and human impacts, because this directly relates to how we can think of the diversity of grasslands globally, as well as what we see in the United States and, and have some realistic expectations about what we see. Now, um, when, we, when we look at the diversity of grasslands that we have, there's no question that there are inherent uh, properties. Where you are in the globe, where you are in the landscape, what kind of climate um, that uh, area has evolved with, what is the geology, what are the uh, soils there? These are inherent components uh, to a system that plays a huge role. But what we see today also has a huge influence on uh, from um, our human activities, which could have modified things. And, and we have a tremendous amount of modification in the systems that we see now. So we could have uh, modified what actually grows there, what actually is allowed to exist there. Um, soil might've changed, et cetera. And so these all play a really critical role when we look at things like the ecosystem services that now can be provided by a system based on how it uh, evolved, the inherent properties and how it's been managed. This also uh, plays into issues of resilience and resistance, which you know, certainly ties into um, how we are existing on the land, how we're managing it and how we might adapt to that. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and turn it back over to John. Thank you, Amy, thank you both. Um, so Amy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you uh, with the question. Uh, and I, I, I'm 
I'm wondering if you could take a minute to describe what you mean that your research is mechanistic, but let mm -hmm. me ground that and ask you to speak a little bit about an important ecosystem service you mentioned, which is carbon sequestration. So what mm -hmm. is carbon sequestration and um, why is it important and and how do we how how does work that you and others do in the research realm help us understand um, carbon sequestration and related issues? Mm -hmm. So so um, as I mentioned, there's a tremendous amount of work that has been done on on um, or that is being done on carbon sequestration and and really the whole idea behind carbon sequestration is um, we're trying to capture it in a stable form, right? Um, a lot of our effort in grasslands is trying to look at um, that capture in soil and, and very stable, because you can have stable carbon in that that uh, can be lost very easy. So we want to look at um, stable carbon that's captured in the soil. Um, carbon is really critical to a lot of um, soil health and uh, the ability for plants to have great resources. To, to grow. Um, there's also other forms of uh, carbon sequestration. Some people look at the above ground biomass and, and sometimes you know, people really get excited with, with trees because you can count them much easier than you can count grass, right? So uh, those of us that have spent a lot of time on our, our knees counting grass uh, know that very well. Um, so um, why is carbon sequestration such a, a big issue? As we, as we look at the climate, um, change that has been um, that we've been experiencing, as well as projections. A lot of that um, is directly tied to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, carbon being one of them, nitrous oxide being another, methane being another. Um, the the when we when we look at these goals related to carbon sequestration, it's really um, dealing with those com components that that we can address um, directly by, um, in this case, vegetation management uh, and and being smart in that way. Now, mechanistic. Okay, so when I use the term mechanistic, a, a lot of my work from a research standpoint, and, and I think I, I developed this when I was a kid, um, my, you know, I, we had these old wind clocks. I, I used to take them apart and then put them back together to understand how they worked, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when, when we talk about mechanistic research, we're really trying to understand how is that system functioning? How does it work? Because if we can understand what components drive certain things, we can put them into two categories. Those we can't affect because it's not possible, it's out of our realm, and those that we can affect, right? So from a management standpoint, we can use that knowledge to recognize where, where you know, should we make some changes uh, or, um, you know, look to um, develop new ways of, of doing things. So th that's where that mechanistic comes from. And thank you for, for asking that question. Awesome, thank you. So Terry, speaking of mechanisms, um, can you speak a little to that in that last slide you showed, you showed um, a variety of different habitat, habitat types, um, everything from very short grass to very tall grass. Um, mostly not shrubs, but maybe some shrubs. We might get back to that and talk about fire and, and grazing and so forth. But I'm um, just thinking for a minute about that diversity of habitats. What are the mechanisms that created and sustain that diversity? Um, some of it is those ecological processes. So fire is one of those that can can change the species composition and the and the structure that you see out there. Um, but also something that Amy said, the potential. So we start with the soil, and the soil coming from the parent material and such that um, some has a greater ability to to uh, produce or for shrubs to thrive in versus other grass species, so shorter versus um, uh, taller. Uh, so it's a lot of that, but then I'll go back to the management of those lands. So the way we control livestock, the way we um, do a lot of the work on the land, um, if we're plowing that land and we're planting species, uh, then that's going to determine what we what we're gonna, what kind of habitat you have out there. So a lot of that is in our control as being private landowners and, um, and public land managers um, as to what kind of habitat will be out there. 
And um, over time, we've gotten better. And remember the Dust Bowl way back in the day, um, we uh, were not managing the land very sustainably. We've learned how to do that. But in many ways, we end up managing towards a moderate amount of grazing and a moderate kind of structure. And then species that need those ends either need more bare ground because they evolve with prairie dogs and buffalo wallows or uh, want much taller grass structure, um, don't have as much habitat as they might've had in the past. So uh, where there was naturally bison traveling across the landscape and um, hanging out in different areas for different periods of time, you really had quite the mosaic of structure and habitat across the landscape, um, which is on top of the potential of all those soils. So you had such a diversity of habitats, therefore you had a diversity of species. Now we tend to think a bit about, we don't wanna to do too much, so we manage for that moderate condition. And some of those species on the ends tend to not have the habitat they need and enough um, of it uh, to have thriving populations. So Terry, you mentioned bison and um... I'm wondering when when we think about bison. So my first question, so I've read that there may have been 30 to 50 million bison um, through this through throughout North America, particularly um, in the grasslands that, that are in the middle of, of the continent. Um, so is is that is that the right ballpark number? And can you speak to, I mean, it's a really big range, right? But it's a big yes. number in any case. Yes. But can you speak to a little bit of, more about the, the way we either know the bison worked or, or speculate that, that what they did to grasslands and that relationship between bison and grasslands? Oh, great question. Um, I don't know the exact number and nobody really knows how many bison there were. We know there were a lot. Um, uh, and again, uh, we have to make inferences because we weren't writing that down. And by the time people came from, you know, the explorers came and wrote things down, we'd already changed the landscape greatly. There's been uh, some recent studies that have shown that um, the diseases that impacted some native species traveled faster than the explorers. And so um, a big run sheep in some areas in, in Wyoming and such were thought to have been destroyed before anybody ever came and started writing down what they were seeing. So uh, a lot of our information is anecdotal. It's, it's kind of archeological kind of research um, to understand what was there um, in the past. What we know is from watching the species currently in the areas where they are, and studying them. Um, so bison in Wind Cave and in Yellowstone and in other places, and in looking at some of those early um, exploration or explorer notes, and absolutely using traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous folks. Uh, what were their stories and their, their knowledge of what um, happened with bison. So um, uh, understanding what's happening what and watching and, and, and seeing what the impacts are of, of bison on grasslands and starting to um, then make inferences about what that was like in the, in the past. So that's kind of where we get that knowledge. Um, I, and just very quickly, a question from Gary. Um, is CSU still actively studying uh, bison on Soapstone Prairie? And the answer is yes. Um, and, but uh, to learn a lot more about that, you'll want to join us in two weeks. Nice. Uh, I think that's on the 27th of April, where we'll be focusing particularly on Soapstone Prairie, which for those of you who don't know, is um, right on the Wyoming border. Uh, north of Fort Collins here. And uh, we'll be sp speaking with our couple of guests in two weeks about all the fantastic conservation work that's been done um, uh, on Soapstone Prairie and in that area, including bison restoration. Um, so, so we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, Terry. I was just gonna say the, the other way we, we know about bison, as I said, were some of those national parks and places where we have bison 
but also um, doing research on places where bison are uh, being grazed as livestock or on preserves. And the Nature Conservancy has quite a few preserves across the Great Plains um, that have bison on them at, at a larger scale. The issue is that we can study them in these small places, but then you have to make the inference about what did they do across big, really big landscapes. And um, uh, the most bison are held by um, Ted Turner and on his ranches, and he does allow and, and encourage a lot of research. And so um, there's, there's definitely been some studies, a lot of research done on his properties um, across the Great Plains because he has ranches from Mexico up into Montana um, with bison on them. So we can start to understand and, and see those dynamics of how they create bison wallows are created and what species come into those systems, whether they hang out in the riparian areas, which they don't tend to, or they how they move across the landscape. So that's a, that's a great um, source for, for information. So Amy, in, in the job that you're fairly new in, um, you're working very directly with uh, livestock producers. Um, and we've gotten a, a couple of questions from our audience on, um, on cattle in particular. And, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, actually, I'm gonna ask you a two-part question. Um, first, can you tell us um, what a keystone species is? That, that, uh, that phrase has come up and it's something we talk about a lot in the grasslands context. So you, can you talk about a key, what is a keystone species as it relates to bison or other critters? But then uh, in the context of the food systems that you work in and the agricultural producers, um, what is the role of cattle? And to what extent do cattle um, have a, a similar role as bison and, and, um, and where are they where might they be problematic or how could they be problematic? Excellent, yeah, thank you very much. And, and John, you know, my, my, in my previous life uh, as an academic, I had more opportunities to interact directly with producers now a little bit less, but um, I, I definitely uh, appreciate uh, that, those opportunities. Um, so um, first question about um, this, the, the role of livestock. In, in the start with the, the role of livestock in, in these systems. Um, so, well, actually, John, help me out. What was the first question? Keystone species. Have... What, what the heck keystone is species, a keystone yes. species? <laughs> All right, keystone species, thank you. Um, so keystone species are species that have a disproportionate effect on landscapes, All right? And, um, you know, there, there, there have been um, some arguments in, in circles that, we could, in, in some circumstances, think of it as a keystone process. So when we think of species like bison and cattle, um, the argument, you know, so, some people um, want to uh, make that suggestion that we're, we're looking at a, a process, which is grazing, right? That, um, uh, that perhaps cattle can um, provide uh, some of those uh, services. Um, I, I would say, and, and Terry um, will uh, probably have a little bit more context than I do in this respect, um, but there's been a tremendous amount of research done on that, and there, there are ways to improve um, the way that cattle can mimic um, some of the, the bison um, grazing patterns and impacts that they've had on the landscape, but they certainly are uh, different. And certainly um, because of the way we have our grazing system set up now, um, in terms of um, fences and, you know, um, pastures or allotments, depending on where you are, that aren't uh, large and restrict movement, you know, th there are going to be some differences. Um, but keystone processes, uh, keystone species in general, um, are referred to species that have those disproportionate effects. And, and Terry, do you want to speak specifically to um, more uh, um, uh, detailed information about bison impacts. You're probably more familiar than sure. me. Sure, I, I can I can take a stab at it here. Um, uh, I yes, cattle and 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 bison graze somewhat differently. That a, a cattle 
will hang in riparian areas and can have a, a bigger impact in those areas if if they're not managed to, to keep them out or to, to limit their time in those areas. We've seen that in the past. Um, but I really want to point out that the bigger issue that we have in grasslands um, you lose species and you have a much, uh, when you compare the grass, the grasses and forbs that are in an area with bison grazing and with live mm -hmm. cattle grazing, you see a lot of the same species. It impacts more structure than it does the species composition. If you stop grazing either bison or if you do not have a large grazer in the area, that's a much bigger impact to the grassland composition, to the grasses and the forbs in that area, then, then you see a, a hugely different um, system when you put an exclosure out there and you keep all livestock out. And, and especially if you continue to keep everything out, if you keep rabbits and mice and other things out, the, it um, becomes a very, what we would consider degraded system without grazing. So the main thing, a takeaway I, I take from that um, as, as a conservationist is grazing is a necessary ecological process for grasslands. And that it's much more important that we have some large mammal out there grazing than none. And so cattle in that sense is, is a great surrogate. Um, it also provides a livelihood for people and also means that then our grasslands are not developed. Um, uh, as because if we cannot provide um, livelihoods, so ecosystem services again, you can't have those livelihoods on the land. You're much more likely to have more degradation on those lands and um, maybe lose them as as grasslands in the long term. And I think we jumped into your second, was there a second question that you had asked Amy that I think we lost? Yeah, yeah, about the livestock and how, how oh. they, uh, you think you addressed it quite, uh, okay. quite directly about uh, what livestock do that, that does or does not mimic uh, a cattle. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick on bison and cattle just a, a, a couple minutes longer um, because we're, we've got several questions about grazing systems and and bison and grazing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna combine two and uh, ask uh, either or both of you to chime in on this. Um, so um, one question is, um, what about large predators and how did they affect, how, what, what do we understand if anything or what do we speculate might've been the role of large predators um, uh, as they related to grazers on the grasslands um, that, that then link back to these, the, the ecosystem services that Amy was talking about, habitat and otherwise. So large predators, but then I think related, um, you know, as um, those of us who have spent some time uh, working on grasslands are very familiar <laughs> with the lo long uh, and complicated debates about how we manage cattle. Um, do we just put them out in the pasture and leave them there all summer? Do we very actively move them? And maybe that has something to do with what predators might have done. But can you speak a little bit to, um, to this um, uh, active management or either natural patterns of bison and predators and or um, management of bison to mimic what we think were, were were the historic conditions of grasslands? So, <clears throat> so Terry, if you if you want to handle the predator question, I could probably address the, the grazing question. Why don't you start? That sounds great. <clears throat> okay, so, and John, I think you, you might have also been wanting to connect that with cattle and how cattle is managed now, right? And so um, when, when we think of this this debate around grazing and, and I, I knew this was going to come up because it is the uh, hottest topic when, when you you are talking about grasslands and rangelands and um, production systems um, th there is quite a bit of controversy um, and and really comes down to um, intensive based strategies that often uh, involve rotations where um, you are moving animals around to take advantage um, of uh, their ability to uh, use uh, herbage or consume uh, vegetation 
and then move them on. And so typically the, the um, grazing is more intense, more animals, and then you're trying to move them on versus something that is more um, continuous season long where you have animals out, they have um, more opportunity to graze and select where, where they are. Um, one of the issues associated, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, if you have a manager that is approaching this with a, an adaptive strategy in mind, you can make things work, right? Because you're paying attention to what the vegetation is doing, you're paying attention to what the animals are doing and making decisions based on that. If you try to take um, a recipe from sea level, like a, a baking recipe from sea level and go to high elevation, you know it's not gonna work the same way, right? And so since we have been talking about land potential, um, when we look at the species that occur in these different grasslands, some have evolved with high herbivory levels, meaning that they have strategies that they can regrow, right? Like the lawns that you mow all the time, right? So those, those species might be better apt for that intense grazing and frequent grazing than some other species that didn't evolve with that intensity, right? So, from a science standpoint, um, can grazing occur in all of these systems? Yes. Can you, can you look at it from different standpoints, rotational or not? Absolutely. But it does require those other components. It's not as simple as looking at a calendar. It requires you to look at the vegetation, right? Because we know, especially with climate change, things are growing at different times and different amounts. Um, so, so that's just like a, a little bit of background in terms of the rationale of, of how that works. Um, and now, Terry, with regards to predators, I think you're probably much more <laughs> suited to address that question. Sure. Um, uh, in, interesting question. I, I, again, we don't know um, a lot of that historic for North America or for other parts of the world it, where, where we impacted the predators so much that we don't see those natural systems occurring very well. Um, but we are starting to see a few things that might um, tell us that it's similar around the world, that, that having lots of predators um, move animals around. Um, they're much more diligent. They're much more looking at it. I'm thinking of wolves in Yellowstone. In the, one of your last series that you talked about, um, uh, John, that you had somebody on who, who, who spoke to or spoke about um, uh, what we've seen there. I think that's that obviously is is something that happened um, with a lot of animals. Not so much, I don't think, with bison because bison are really well adapted at protecting their their young, and they're just such big animals that um, uh, they they probably were moved around a little bit, but they tend to just be a mobile animal anyway. They gra graze and move and graze and move, and that's just kind of part of their you know, to have those really big herds, you could not stay in any one place because you're gonna eat yourself out of food. So they just are naturally a very roaming um, species. So I don't think they were as um, moved around as much as elk and deer and other um, uh, kind of more, I'll say medium-sized for lack of a better <laughs> term, um, uh, herbivores that we have on the landscape. Um, and then we also have things like pronghorn that are so fast that they could outrun and, and pull uh, any kind of predator away from their young that, that is sitting in hiding um, right after they're born. So species that um, evolved with those predators evolve strategies for coping with them and for staying in an area if that was best suited for um, their um, survival or continuing to move. If, so in lots of different strategies um, for evolving with predators. I wanted to speak a little bit to what Amy was saying though too. Uh, there's a project just uh, northeast of Fort Collins, the Collaborative Adaptive Range Management uh, uh, Research Project that I'm one of the stakeholders on that project. And we have a herd that stays in one place and we have a second herd that uh, is rates rotated around the landscape and one of our main conclusions was um, you can meet your multiple objectives much easier when you move animals around and and it while it matters how you move them and when you move them to meet certain goals 
And there we're trying to meet some of these uh, bird objectives where you want taller grasses and, tall, and shrubs for some species and you want really short, short grass for other species. The, the, you're only really able to achieve that by rotating cattle around the landscape so that you can say, we're gonna graze these pastures that we've identified are important for short, short grass in this time of year so that next spring we'll have the right kind of habitat. So um, I think as, as Amy was suggesting, having clear goals and objectives for what you're trying to meet on the land um, that while it's, if you are a private rancher, it is about economics. Also being cognizant of what kind of wildlife you, habitat you have or could have on your land and setting objectives for that. The only way you can meet kind of those multiple objectives, which is often what we're trying to do on public lands, is to have some type of rotational system. That's great. Thank you, boy, there's so much to cover and we're not gonna get through everything. We got about 15 minutes left and I would be remiss if, um, if I didn't ask you a bit about climate. And we've got a few questions from our attendees uh, about climate and um, climate and fire. So a, a couple of questions then. What, um, so the, the climate, uh, how is the climate changing in in our grasslands and what 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 does that mean for drought and fire and so forth and then amy maybe you can start on this and how does that relate to how does that impact these processes you've talked about or how does our changing climate impact those processes but then also if you could speak to the value of grasslands as a buffer to climate and helping us build resiliency against climate change. Excellent, excellent. So um, first, uh, how is climate uh, impacting uh, grasslands? Um, so like see in the area that many of the um, people in the audience are, are from Colorado and then as you move south, there's no question that the um, hotter and drier uh, climate has, has had quite a bit of uh, impact on drought. And, and one of the things that um, particularly is th that we're seeing is that we're having longer growing seasons with um, temperatures not getting nearly as low as they used to. So the baseline of what our plant communities, our animals are, are dealing with is much higher than it traditionally has, right? Um, and then if that is coupled with precipitation that is either delayed um, or doesn't uh, happen uh, nearly uh, to the level that it historically did, um, we're really um, setting up uh, the plant communities for, for quite a bit of a challenge. Um, now, throughout much of the grasslands in the United States, um, that certainly drought is something that is heavily impacting, um, but you do also see some isolated pockets where they um, you, you periodically have um, above average rain, which causes its own problems like uh, invasive plant species like Kentucky bluegrass and smooth roam in, in more of our, our cooler, um, wet, uh, wet northern Great Plains. Um, so uh, climate change is absolutely impacting that. Um, it, it's requiring a lot of nimble action for managers in terms of responding to these situations, preparing um, and making sure that um, they can uh, address these situations as they come up. Um, and, and then John, uh, your two part questions are, are kind of tripping me up. So. Yes, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy to repeat. <laughs> the second part of that, so you've spoken to the, the impacts of, of uh, our changing climate on grasslands, mm -hmm. but what, what then is the, the role of grasslands in helping oh. us build resiliency against this uh, changing climate? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, there are many of our um, arid and semi-arid uh, grasslands, and there's plenty of the semi-arid grasslands in, in Colorado, um, have uh, evolved under um, some drier conditions, and, and they, they can, many of the species in those systems, can respond well. Now, the prolonged droughts that we are seeing um, are a bit problematic though, because we are, we are seeing um, some shifts in species composition um, that we, we you know, haven't seen in, in quite some time, right? And so um, I, I think the, in more of the drier areas, um, 
the species have been able to handle that better. Um, but you mentioned fire, and, and one of the things that um, is a challenge as we have these drier conditions, some um, shift in species, some species that aren't able to um, necessarily survive um, prolonged drought, um, you, you do have an increased risk for wildfire. Now, um, generally speaking, in, in terms of like the buffers from a climate regulation standpoint, um, as long, if we're talking about just grasslands, fire doesn't always, or most of the time, doesn't cause a tremendous, um, uh, it doesn't cause much damage, right? Because fires in grasslands are often quick moving, fast moving, um, and, and don't have the intensity as a lot of um, other systems would have. It's just how bad is the drought? Because if those plants are already stressed, that's when you get into those situations. Um, but one thing that's really interesting to consider with fire, um, and when, when people think of the potential for certain systems to really have a, um, a climate buffering impact, and even from a carbon sequestration standpoint, um, some research that came out of um, University of California, Davis, um, so specifically looking at California systems, you know, they, they um, remarked about the, the fact that grasslands and rangeland systems there might have a much um, larger potential for carbon sequestration because of the um, extensive wildfire situation and the loss of carbon from those four systems. So just a lot of interesting things to consider in that respect. When I think about climate change, I also think about, um, so it seems like we're going to have much more frequent drought, much more extensive, so longer lasting, um, and and the heat effect that you that you also mentioned, um, while that impacts us as people, it also Im impacts livestock. And so, um, if you can't produce as much forage, if you can't have as many cattle on the land, if you it's like the economic size of a of a ranch that's viable, vi from economic viability standpoint, and um, probably something you'll touch on in future topics or future um, sessions, that it's, um, if, if we can't make livelihood off those private lands, what's going to happen to those private lands? And so if it makes it harder um, uh, with climate change, um, what are the ways that we can uh, not buffer it, but, but help uh, producers be as resilient as they can and, and be able to respond to the changes that are out there? So Terry, you're you're actually kind of hinting at another question that um, that we've seen come up from a few of our audience members around um, um, smaller patches of grassland. So you mentioned that um, if if they're if the lands aren't being actively used for bison or cattle, then they might go to a different pur purpose, including, of course, subdivisions and 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 so forth. Um, I wonder a couple of the questions we have is can you speak to sort of like what is what's the minimum size of a healthy grassland and um, and and is there any value like here in Fort Collins we've got a bunch of parks and such that are you know tens of acres and they have prairie dogs in them or something like that. What's the value in these smaller patches of grasslands that we see scattered up and down the front range of Colorado, for example? Boy, um, uh, it depends on what your goal is for that land, whether what the, the appropriate size is. If, you're, if you want a um, sustainable uh, um, uh, antelope population, it's probably you know, 500,000 acres or something on that scale to have intact grasslands that can have many or most of the species that would, that should be there, um, but if there are values to smaller areas, and especially for rare plants that are only found on certain geologies, which some of those uh, parks around Fort Collins have uh, uh, have some rare plants on them that can that only occur there because it's got it, that potential with that certain geology, certain soil type. Um, so those are incredibly important for for biodiversity on a larger scale. Um, so I, I I go back to adaptive management. That's my fallback, being a planner and being um, a conservationist, thinking about what are our goals for those places. 
And is it big enough? Is the land big enough to provide for, for the species that we're gonna focus on in that area? And um, we can't have every species everywhere, just from that, that graph I showed at the beginning that they, you, you know, you can't have really tall grass and really short grass in the same place, but can we provide enough of that habitat or in certain places, can we provide for those species that need the ends that we, we can't have a lot of land out there on um, the really tall end or the really lightly grazed end, and we really can't have hundreds of thousands of acres being in bare ground um, without having dust bowl. So, or it's really hard to manage for it too. So how can we provide places where you can um, uh, have the habitat that we're missing in certain places or that certain species that have really declined over recent times need special requirements that can't be managed at large scales? John, if I could add something to that really quick, you know, something else to consider, and I know um, your area has a lot of uh, smaller parcels and a lot of uh, open land that has set aside, been set aside for open land. Um, that's where we also get into the cultural ecosystem services where recreation, I, you know, those lands are really valuable for recreation. Um, they're really valuable for education as well. Um, and, and, you know, coming back to uh, something that Terry pointed out before in terms of objectives and goals, you know, when, when you have smaller parcels of land, often um, that's supported from conservation dollars, right? It, it doesn't always have to be something that's being driven by production, but, but it, it does help. I mean, you know, even if it's an education uh, purpose, then, you know, that's translating into more awareness and people recognizing the value of not necessarily converting. So, yeah. That's great. All right. Well, in our, in our waning minutes here, um, Amy, I'm going to ask you, uh, um, I'll try to avoid another two-part question. <laughs> it's a bad habit of mine, sorry. Um, but to, to, to wrap us up, um, I'm, I'm curious if you could share a little bit of what, you know, what really draws you to these places and what, what do you love about grasslands and what do you want to share with others uh, who are listening in today um, about why you hope we can maintain uh, healthy, resilient grasslands into the future. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I was uh, raised in Eastern Deciduous Forest. So for me, rangelands and grasslands were, were new and I was a kid in a candy shop. Um, so, so I've worked in private land states and public land states. And, and that's one thing I wanted to mention from the standpoint that your, your stakeholders do change, right? Um, one of the reasons why I have always enjoyed working, my experience working in a, a variety of uh, grassland related systems is the connection of people. And, and in, in some, if it's a private land situation, often your primary stakeholder is the, uh, the, the private landowners or managers that they, they have. Um, in the um, mixed ownership landscape, so mixtures of state, public, um, and private land, you're really bringing together diverse groups of people to try to figure out how they can manage in this, this landscape that's connected. We might have fence lines, but they're gradients, right? And so for me, um, I, I, I love the science components, but the, the personal component, the social component of that is something that I've always uh, been fascinated with. Um, plus I love grass. I had the opportunity to teach a grass just on, uh, or a course just on grass taxonomy. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those uh, crazy people that uh, will will find um, beauty in 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 things that uh, some people don't necessarily appreciate. So thank you. Fantastic, Fantastic. thank you, Amy. Terry, in one minute or less, uh, <laughs> what 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 drives you here? What do you really love about these places? I, I love the diversity. So people, absolutely. Uh, also the just the species that can be found there. I just find it fascinating, and and their adaptations to living in a dry um, harsh environment and how they respond to drought and respond to uh, fire and, and grazing. Um, I just find that fascinating. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so very much. Um, thank you both of you, Amy and Terry. Um, uh, we, there's a lot we didn't cover here. Um, we got three more episodes where we'll be talking about culture. We'll be talking about, um, we'll be hearing from a private, uh, landowner on how they manage their cattle for grassland health. 
we'll be talking about fire and prairie dogs and much more. So um, invite, I invite all of you to join us over the next three weeks, same time at noon on Wednesday. Amy and Terry, thank you so much. And all of you who tuned in, um, really appreciate you taking an hour out of the middle of your day to join us. Thank you all.